This show may contain explicit language and or spoilers. Welcome back to the Greatest Movie of All Time podcast. I'm Tom Duncan. And I'm Dana Duncan. And if you're noticing a quality difference, uh, we've upgraded our equipment. Uh, so celebration on that. Woo! All right. Tonight we bring you one of our uh, personal favorites, the 1980 movie Airplane, starring Peter Graves and Robert Stack, Leslie Nielsen, Julie Haggerty, and uh, many more. Uh, so what is your connection to this movie, Pop? Well... First of all, I saw the movie in the theater when it was released. I remember very well uh, watching Good Morning America with Barbara Billingsley being a guest on there promoting the film. And I saw the clip of her uh, saying, excuse me, stewardess, I speak jive um, and thought this is something I've got to go see. And I thought it was uh, incredibly funny. It was something fresh and original and something that um, – uh, really impacted me after having watched it again and thought about it. Uh, I honestly would say that of if if I had to make a list of movies that have had an impact on my life, this would be in the top five because it has so influenced my sense of humor and how I make jokes and what I find funny. Um, your mother argued with me and said, a comedy can't have that much influence. And I said, well, I said, I know somebody said that one of the things that attracted me to her was uh, that I made her laugh. So um, I think it has had quite a bit of impact. So my entire experience with this movie is through you. You've been often quoting, you've been um, putting together comedic timing lines um, from this movie forever. Uh, all of the little cues and all, all of the things that go around, even some of the stuff that we're not going to probably put in our um, best quotes and, and some of the other stuff like, oh, wh- what is a hospital? Or uh, uh, we need to take these people to a hospital. Or what's that? And, you know, you, you go right into this or a drinking problem. And it's, it's subverting the comedic um, timing or the uh, ex or expected um, I guess what the, the expected outcome of the joke you're you're completely going off in a, a different tangent than the audience had anticipated and it works and despite its um, sophomore or kind of uh, sophomoric attitude to borrow a phrase from uh, Roger Ebert's review um, it works on that level. Uh, at least to the point where it's kind of aged. Um, some of the comedy is still, if, if you take it within context, works. But there, there are some definite things. If you tried to do this movie in um, currently, or uh, tried to do this movie currently, it would have a very difficult time um, resonating in the way that it did at the time. But this was completely fresh. Yes, it was completely original. It was done in a way that was completely, you know, I mean, most every, you know, thing that was funny, that was comedy, was the one-liners, like uh, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby and the road pictures. You know, it's that type of thing. This was revolutionary in how you did a movie. It took some of the better parts of things that were different, which was like uh, laugh-in, and some of the stage comedy of um, uh, Saturday Night Live and the skits and such that were being done, Second City TV or, or Second City comedy, those types of things, and built it within the context of a movie, which was never done before. And so to that extent, it, it was completely different. And what I think has happened is, is so many te- people tried to emulate what took place in this movie – it became mainstream and has lost some of the luster or the uh, com- the comedic me- uh, uh, meat 
because it has become kind of commonplace and and well worn. Now, I won't say that it's it is uniquely fresh in its sense of humor, but its subject material and its context, um, where it kind of came from, the origination, um, the the premise essentially is not necessarily new. Um, the spoof, as it had been, has already been done. We've discussed one of. Uh, the biggest spoofs of all time in Young Frankenstein already on the podcast. Blazing Saddles had been before it, Spaceballs. Um, I would say that to a certain degree, Caddyshack is a spoof on sports movies. Uh, and that came out the same year, although I don't know if it's like the same time. But without some – or a movie like this, uh, I don't think you get so, to a place where you have the scary movie franchise or uh, – some of the scream after that that are more comedic um, kind of subverting the horror genre. And this is another one of those films in context that they built off of um, going into the nineties and early two thousands. I'm just saying in a, a current context of where we're at now, um, it's kind of dated a little bit as far as some of the jokes and the, and the rest of it is, but that's okay. There's still enough here. That's classic. Um, that'll come back around when we kind of get out to the grading. Um, so what is this movie about? I, I, I really struggled with this particular category as we kind of went about, um, because it's not really a movie about anything. It's, it's a spoof of disaster films and it just tries to upend the regular comedic paradigm. Well, um, Jim Abrahams, um, and, uh, the Zucker brothers, happened to be watching a rerun of a film in the early 70s from 1957 written by Arthur Haley, who did Airplane, or uh, excuse me, the airport movies. And I think he did Towering Inferno and a bunch of disaster films. He okay. did this as a, it was his first movie he did. It was made for TV. Um, they started th- thinking about how they could make this into a comedy and so they bought the script. They bought the rights to the Zero Hour film and rewrote it uh, with comedy in there. So, in fact, the, a lot of the lines, the more serious lines and the storyline are almost verbatim from the original Arthur Haley uh, screenplay. So <clears throat> it is a, a disaster film and it's a spoof on disaster films. And it's in part uh, making fun of how serious or uh, these films took themselves. And in fact, well, go ahead. in fact, they really wanted to uh, find serious actors who had never done comedy before. Yes. In order to do it, because they wanted them all to be so deadpan that people would uh, initially go. Was he supposed to be that funny? And that's exactly the the reaction a lot of people got. That's why you had guys like Robert Stack, who was starred in The Untouchables. He yep. didn't do comedy. Peter, Peter Graves, Graves from Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible. Yep. Uh, Leslie Nielsen had been a longtime uh, character actor, television actor, um, doing a lot of serious parts, war films, etc. Um, I mean, he came from no background in comedy. In fact... He came from a very serious family. His brother was the uh, deputy prime minister of Canada under Pierre Trudeau. So before I forget, um, we should probably just quickly cover the plot summary, although you don't really need it um, a a ton here in order to get the background of this movie. It's it's a comedy poking fun at a, a potential disaster uh, type of situation, but and we'll hit uh, the quick recognition for this uh, movie. But um, this spoof comedy takes shots at, us, at the slew of disaster movies that were released in the 70s. When the passengers and crew of a jet are inca- incapacitated due to food poisoning, a rogue pilot with a drinking problem must cooperate with his ex-girlfriend turned stewardess to bring the plane to a safe landing. Uh, recognition, it was on the AFI 2000 list, 100 Years, 100 Laughs, at number 10 as the 10th best comedy of all time. Uh, it was on the AFI's 2005 list of 100 Years, 100 Movie Quotes for Ted Stryker's Surely You Can't Be Serious, 
Dr. Rumack, I am serious, and don't call me Shirley, at number 79. So, um, I guess, should we just move into the performances? Sure. So, I'll lead this one off, actually. I, I think this is an obvious one, but it, for me, I actually nominated three um, because not only did, was it their formation, it was their script, but they also directed it and saw the complete vision of the movie. It's really hard not to give it to Zucker, Zucker, and Abrahams. Yeah, I would agree with that for the most part. I mean, they tried to get this thing made for a big chunk of the 70s, and it was only by a fluke when they took on another project called Kentucky Fried Movie and ended up making 10 times budget on that. that the studio let them have a budget to do this film. And then it ended up being, I think it was something like a hundred times budget as far as the gross. Yeah, I mean, this movie did actually make quite a bit of money um, after its uh, initial release. Um, it really was kind of one of those DVD movies that ended up in rentals, uh, making a lot more for the money than the box office originally did. Um, so it, it kind of has had a second life. Uh, in that capacity, and I, I think it's still accruing money um, in that regard. But um, given kind of where it was at as far as a budget, I wanted to say it was only um, like a 10 or $15 million budget. Um, it really maximized its effort for what it was uh, trying to accomplish in that. And uh, for as kind of goofy a comedy with the amount of weird shtick that goes on in this, um, they accomplished it well without seeming or too many things seeming out of place, even to the effect of the autopilot. Yes. And in fact, they come, they came back to it. Uh, the Zuckers got hired by Wisconsin department of tourism and they had Brad Hayes and Kareem Abdul Jabbar, Robert, reprise, Hayes. Or Robert Hayes, excuse me, rep, rep, uh, reprise their roles flying over Wisconsin and talking about, travel to Wisconsin. So this has had a lot of pop cultural through lines, but uh, who was your best performer? Well, I would agree on the, on uh, the three, but as far as the actual performers in the movie, um, there are two that just are jump out actually a third uh, to some extent. I mean, Leslie Nielsen was so good in this film. It was so uh, clear that he had missed an, a golden opportunity early in his career to be a comedic actor. Robert Stack played this so well. And then uh, Lloyd Bridges was um, was also very good. But I, I would say it's between Robert Stack and, uh, and, and Leslie Nielsen. Okay. And that that's – so if I asked you to choose between the two. Nielsen. Still have a, Nielsen. That's who I went with my best minor performer um, as – in contrast. I, I think he is so wonderfully cast in this. Um, the fact that he was like the fifth choice in casting in order to do this after a bunch of other people turned him, them down – um, is somewhat amazing, but sometimes, it, and again, this gets to the notion that we've mentioned on a uh, dozen occasions already in doing the course of this movie, this being episode 33 already, that a movie, especially a successful movie, is a bunch of happy accidents. And there were a ton of happy accidents. There's a, a particular thing with uh, Peter Graves that I'd like to get to when we get to the uh, whole classicness debate, but uh, getting him to do the movie was uh, a challenge. Getting Robert Stack to do the movie was a challenge. Um, you had multiple other people try out for uh, Robert Hayes's part as well as Julie Haggerty's part. Originally, Robert Hayes's part was written for David Letterman. So when you yes. get this whole thing, I mean, it's a completely different movie if you don't have all of these people come together and make it exactly what it is. Sigourney Weaver was originally uh, offered the part of the Julie Haggerty head. So uh, I – but going back to Nielsen, the the way he plays so serious and straight, it meets the moment of this movie as the disaster movie, but everything he does – because of how serious it is and how deadpan it is, is just absolutely hilarious. 
Um, the the entire scene. I know we do the "Don't call me Shirley" as as one of the great quotes of all time. But that whole monologue he does, where Peter Graves is basically collapsing in on himself when he's <laughs> in the pilot. I mean, yeah. it's just just great. And he he does this whole monologue. I mean, credit to Peter Graves there too for uh, everything that he did during that particular scene and and his little meltdown um, because he realizes he has the food poisoning, but. Still, I mean, that's he's probably the most notable of the performances uh, that I can think of for this movie. And I, I just felt he needed to be recognized, even if I had to classify it under my minor performance category. Well, I mean, there was a reason why uh, Zucker, Zucker and Abrahams, and, uh, Abrahams um, recruited him to do Police Squad, which was their TV show. And I, and along with about five other people, watched that every week for the four weeks ABC let it run before they canceled it (laughs) because it was way too out there for everybody. I mean, you know, they, they, there's a, for instance, they were doing a scene where um, they're having a shootout and they're behind um, trash cans and then they pan back and the trash cans are about two feet apart. Um, that's not from the TV show. That's from uh, uh, Naked Gun Two. That yeah. was in the TV show originally. They also start. Or they also had a guest star every week. The first one was Police Squad, and they played the theme and whatever. And then uh, this week's guest star, Lauren Green, and then a, a car screeches to a halt. The door flies open, and a body falls out on the ground dead. And they pan in, and it's Lauren Green, and that's his appearance. Okay, I, I do so, remember the the completely random cameo of Jaja Gabor slapping the um, uh, rotating siren on top of the squad car in uh, Naked Gun Two and a Half. But that's a completely different movie, which we may or may not cover on this uh, particular uh, podcast at a different time. Um, who was your uh, best minor performer? I, I I really, I guess it would have to be Robert Stack because, again, the situation that he just played it so deadpan. The scene, for example, when he's got his sunglasses on and he gets to the tower and he takes off the sunglasses and there's another pair underneath. I mean, <laughs> how he didn't just bust up, I don't know. Or how... He just steps through what we assume was a mirror the whole time and just goes on like there, there's nothing uh, unusual about the whole thing. He was so good at doing that. But um, he creates the energy of the second half of the movie. Uh, most of the stuff revolves around him trying to get the plane down. And so everything that he's trying to do and the conversations he eventually has because it, it creates the stress and all of the – potential action moving forward between him and uh, Robert Hayes. Um, and then given the gravity of the situation, it all kind of comes to a head, but you have all of those things working in concert and he does a wonderful job of doing it, but doesn't ham it up and doesn't play it too seriously to the point where it takes you out of the jokes. All right. So uh, most charismatic, I had Leslie Nielsen. I don't think I, I need to say a whole lot more of this, Um, I think he steals just about every scene he's in, uh, even takes you out of certain scenes. Uh, good luck. I just wanted to, uh, say that, uh, we're all counting on you. And he comes and does that like three different times and it completely breaks the entirety of that, that sequence where you focus on him popping back in. Yes, and I mean, just stuff that's completely random and out of place. You know, for example, the when the, uh, the autopilot and they start to decline or drop in altitude and they pan out to the the uh, uh, passengers and here's Leslie Nielsen lifting his head out. He's giving a vaginal exam to somebody on a table with the stirrups. And you're going like, what the hell is this? But even that, he looks so natural, like. This is nothing unusual. This is exactly where I should be. All right. So uh, did you have him as your most charismatic or did you go with a different? With an honorable mention to 
Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who had never acted before. This was his first foray into acting, and he did a credible job. Yeah, I, I, I can definitely buy into that one. I, I think there there were good performances in a lot of different spaces. Um, I think you could th- theoretically give it to Lloyd Bridges um, because uh, he <laughs> he makes it comedic yet sympathetic every time he's quit something that week. All right, uh, best scenes. Uh, I have a few nominees. I probably missed a few. Uh, I was trying to recall it a little bit more from memory this week as opposed to uh, really pouring back through all of this. But uh, kind of that opening sequence, the red and white uh, parking lines and would you like a flower? All right. Uh, The first introduction of the drinking problem. (laughs) Okay. Can I see the cockpit? Yes. Uh, The first appearance of the autopilot. All right. Retrieving Captain Kramer. Okay. I speak jive. Yes. And then finally, I uh, concluded with uh, what I will aptly name, good luck, we're all counting on you. Well, I have to add a scene that um, I had said that Um, I had actually busted up when I saw the film to begin with and couldn't stop laughing. I was just absolutely hyperventilating. And when the scene came up again now, 40 years later, I'm bust out laughing. And and that's the scene where uh, Lorna Patterson is singing to Jill Whelan, the girl going for the heart transplant. I completely forgot about that. Um, and she she starts singing and gets into the music, ends up pulling out the IV, and the girls like going into convulsions, and everybody's just singing and not noticing this, and it's just to me it's just hilarious. I can't stop thinking about that scene and not and and anytime I do, just starting to giggle. So, uh, let's just call that one acoustic sing along. But uh, is that your uh, best scene? Well, that's my favorite scene. Um, that's not a bad one. Um, I, I would have to say uh, the opening uh, cockpit where it's they're talking, you know, it's the whole s- sequence of Roger, Roger, over, over. And, uh, you know, that whole thing. And then uh, Billy comes to the cockpit to see Peter Graves that just is so that scene sets the entire movie up so that you have clear understanding that this is not normal yeah I had that down as my best scene I I think honestly some of the funniest lines of the whole thing and I I really feel guilty for laughing at a lot of it um which again we're going to get to in grading so I I don't want to um subvert myself too early but uh I think some of the best parts of the movie are right in that kind of middle section where, all right, we've kind of gotten through the premise. We understand what the movie's about. Now we're making all of our best jokes before we kind of get into that conclusory uh, or conclusory period. Um, But can I see the cockpit for me uh, for that whole sequence and everything that goes on around it is probably the best uh, scene that they wrote um, specifically. Uh, for my favorite scene, I gave it to the autopilot introduction. Um, I just, especially that whole sequence where um, uh, you have to uh, reinflate it using the emergency valve. And so <laughs> Julie Harry has got to find it. It's in his lap. And, you know, the whole thing, they pop back up after the fact. And he's smoking a cigarette. And <laughs> um, it, it certainly lets... So is she, for that matter. Yeah. So... Uh, most indelible moment. I think you could make a case for the autopilot being that uh, you could make a case for can I see the cockpit? But I oddly enough went with I am serious and don't call me Shirley. I think there's a reason that the unrated version or the like DVD version of this later on got called the don't call me Shirley uh, version or any of that because it's the most iconic part of the movie Uh, it's the line that most people if you talk to them about this movie know immediately offhand that they can snap their fingers and oh yeah i get that reference point but it also summarizes the entirety of the movie it's turning something that um 
seems completely innocuous, and most of us would say in our normal everyday life, and turning it into one of the most iconic jokes in cinema history. Yeah, and it's it's the wordplay of taking literally something and changing it into something that it's not to make it funny. For example, for years I have made a joke about uh, a, uh, a garage sale is a place where you buy garages. And, you know, it's that kind of what I'm saying that this movie had influence. That's what I'm talking about. It's looking at the literal words and figuring out how you could interpret it differently so that it's absurd. All right. So that's uh, probably a good spot to cut to one of our sponsors for this week. Uh, We'll be back in a second. And now I want to tell you about Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It gives you smart creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone, tablet, or computer and helps you distribute them to all the major platforms like Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, and more. Plus, they help to hook you up with sponsorships like this one no matter the listener size, which will help your help you fund your podcast. And best yet, it's free to use. Look, if you've ever had an itch to talk and express yourself about a topic you like, there is no better time than 2020 to do so. I've started two podcasts this year alone, including this one, and we use Anchor for each and every episode. So what do you have to lose? Download the free Anchor app and or go to anchor.fm to get started making your own podcast today. And welcome back from the break. Um, thank you for rejoining us. Dana has rescued himself some more dad juice, as he likes to refer to it. Um, I think, what what are we drinking this evening? Bourbon. Okay. So um, let's move into the best lines category and start handling that. Um, this might be one of those where it's pretty easy to get the top one. So I will hold it till the end. Um, as a, But I have a few other nominees, let's say, um, before we get to that final one. And for a comedy movie that has so many jokes, a lot of them – are not necessarily in wordplay. They are and they aren't. Um, But you may have a few more to nominate because I I didn't actually have very many for nominations in this one. But uh, first one I had, nervous. Yes, very. First time. No, I've been nervous lots of times. Uh, Number two. Joey, have you ever been in a Turkish prison? Joey. Do you like movies about gladiators? Captain Over, you ever been in a cockpit before? No, sir. I've never been in a plane before. You ever seen a grown man naked? (laughs) There's so many problems with with those lines. I know. I know. All right. So before I do the Lloyd Bridges here, uh, how many different things did he quit um, that week? Cigarettes, drinking, amphetamines, and I think it was then it was sniffing glue. You got all four of them. All right. Looks like I picked the wrong week to stop or to quit sniffing glue, drinking, smoking, and taking amphetamines. Uh, and then finally, can you fly this plane and land it? Surely you can't be serious. I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. Yeah. Is it really a debate as to what the best line is? Uh, no, not really. I mean, there's so many little sight gigs and so many other things. You know, everything from this was Ethel Merman's last movie. They had her do a cameo where, you know, one of the officers thinks he's Ethel Merman. And so, of course, she sits up in bed and starts singing. And, uh, yeah. So... so- I, I will go honorable mention because it's probably one of the most memed things uh, currently going around is the it looks like I picked the wrong week to whatever. And and that has been a, an Internet staple for a while now um, as far as best line. But funniest line for me, it's going to be you ever seen a grown man naked? <laughs> I mean, you and I have oddly <laughs> enough for for uh, a movie and how many problems there are with that line. That is the line that you and I probably quote the most often. 
which is really sad for the both of us. Well, I, I've used the, another line that you didn't mention, uh, which is, you know, when when uh, uh, Dr. Rumack is talking with uh, with Stryker and trying to get his confidence built up and he talks about Lieutenant Zip and then he says, win one for the zipper. <laughs> And I've used that line so many times because I've if never you'll say, heard you use it yes, once. If you if you do that and you're kind of like trying to mock build somebody up, you know, you go, remember, win one for the zipper. And then people will look at you like, huh? Okay, Dad. I, I've never heard you use that once in the entire 30 years that I've known you. I, I don't remember that being the thing, but you would did I've exactly what you accomplished. Yes, you you did exactly what you set up to accomplish, and I'll even give you your complimentary, huh? All right, let's get into the the grading then. Um, what do you have down for legacy? It's forty years, and people still quote the movie. Um, you know, I I gotta give it about. Uh, a minimum an 8.75. I mean, I, I just can't, I, I don't, I thought about a nine and I don't quite because there is a lot of people, younger people who have not seen the movie or who have appreciated the movie. So I can't give it a full nine, but I'll go to 8.75. Well, I went 8.5. I think this has dropped off a little bit more now that the comedy is a little bit more dated and this is a classic to most people probably age 40 or older, um, but this is kind of a generational piece. It's one of those that – I mean, it, to be fair, this movie came out while you were in high school, and you kind of hold the movies that – or the comedy specifically that you grew up with that were in your uh, high school years when you really started to develop your adult sense of humor, um, your college years, your 20s as a certain reverence. Which is why, you know, you and I have very converging opinions on something like Animal House. Now, I can understand and appreciate and um, be or feel more classic about certain other comedies that you grew up with, but I'm never going to have the same reverence. That being said, you are completely accurate. I mean, this has been a pop culture staple for a long time. The fact that only six years ago we're making commercials about this um, for tourism, no less, uh, as a reference point and people were easily able to pick up and get it um, tells you that this movie has had legs. Uh, is this the, or commonly put in one of the great comedies of all timeless? I don't think it's quite on that level, but it's, it's kind of hangs around the edges. Uh, and for all of the things that it props up or um, allows to come after it, I would have to say that this is some something with um, a fairly long tail um, since it came out in 1980. Let me just put this into context of where I am on this film. This film came out in the um, over the winter after Christmas of 1980. I was a sophomore in high school and I had my driver's license for approximately two months. So after we average out our scores, uh, my 8.5 and your 8.75, uh, that comes out to an 8.63 for Legacy. Uh, impact significance. Uh, this wasn't a huge box office draw, but it wasn't a flop either. Um, and I think in the moment, this is still revered as a significant comedy. It was um, – I think it did win a BAFTA. I know it won the Golden Globe for best uh, – comedy musical that year uh it was constantly quoted um among some of the best movies of the year at that time uh and again this is a movie that within a short period of time really had an influence on comedy and how things were um redeveloped uh different courses of uh of movies um and really deadpanning the whole disaster movie type of thing so i went with a straight nine I'm going to go with a nine as well. <clears throat> Let me just put the, the – to say something about this for a historical perspective. 1980, Roger Ebert was the movie critic for the Chicago Sun-Times. 
Uh, Gene Siskel was the movie critic for the Chicago Tribune. They were doing a uh, movie review TV show for public TV in Chicago. Roger Ebert hated this film, did panned it, and it resulted in such a backlash among younger people and among the stars of the film criticizing Robert or Roger Ebert that it made Roger Ebert more of a name. And they went from doing that little mom and pop show on public TV to becoming a syndicated team. Which I, I find to be fascinating. So, I mean, this kind of gives it its own level of impact on that just level alone. I mean, Roger Ebert and maybe Leonard Maltin are the two me or um, uh, movie critics that you might have heard of uh, if you've heard of any of them. Um, you and I have heard of more of them, but, you know, we're nerds. So um, moving yes. forward. Um, so we don't even have to average that one out. That was a straight nine novelty. I also gave a nine. It's not many movies that are going to take this level of prominence uh, to a pedophile pilot. <laughs> uh, I gave it a 9.5 because, again, there was nothing like this when it came out. And it changed how comedies were done. Because after this, you have, um, you know, the Naked Gun movies. You have um, some of these, you know, it. The, it wasn't just the genre or the genre of the movie. It had to do with the way uh, lines were done and the type of comedy that it, it had. It just was nonsensical. But again, I don't think this is at, or as revolutionary as you think. Um, given the fact that you didn't watch Mel Brooks till college, this came several years, or your understanding of the stuff that came before this maybe came after this. So your memory is a little bit distorted because this is the first type of thing that you saw like this. But I don't think in a historical sense, in context, that this is completely out of the ordinary. Uh, you start to think about all the stupid shit that they get away with in uh, Blazing Saddles or um, – you know, Young Frankenstein, the producers, some of those other comedies that some of this stuff was being done. Um, certainly this is very novel in spoofing the disaster film because that hadn't been done before. Some of the wordplay and the lines, how they were written um, and subverting the obvious uh, as far as the lines. And we, we've made uh, reference to that a number of times already going on about this is there. And that's why it's novel. But I, again, I'll even draw it back to it. It's extremely daring for a mainstream comedy that is this well known um, to front and center a guy who has been a revered um, action star from TV and make him into a pedophile. I mean, that alone is incredibly daring. And so from that degree, I will give it a, a extra degree of novelty. I'm not saying that there were a ton of movies like this, but there were a couple that that's why I grade it down to a nine a little bit more than the nine and a half you gave. Well, I, I'm just going by having lived through this time frame and remembering what was and what it wasn't and how comedy was affected and how people perceived comedy and what people thought was funny. And so that's why I'm going with a 9.5 because – I lived it, and that's what I think. I can't justify it any more than that. No, I, I get it. Uh, all right, let's move into classicness. Now, this is the category that it didn't necessarily give me the most trouble out of these, uh, but I probably nitpicked the most and kept, the more I thought about it, knocking points down. Again, you have a pedophile as a central character to this movie and he's not shy about it with other people around and no one makes a comment on it. Not a single person is like looking out for this little boy. Um, you have uh, a entire scene where you have a line of like 30 people slapping a woman. So you have domestic violence in the middle of this movie that's supposed to be funny. Um, you have drinking problems. You have amphetamines. Uh, you have uh, a dog ripping a guy apart. There are so many things that are 
problematic as far as uh, 2020 lenses and our sensitivity, which I know a lot of people are going to then say, oh, this is a great movie just because of all of that stuff. But uh, but you can't separate how much this movie has some very problematic subject material that it makes fun of. But I would say that's probably about most comedies. There are yes. very few that are able to wave that line and make it work where it's not. Well, if you hold that standard, then no one should ever listen to Richard Pryor or um, uh, George Carlin again. Because okay. the stuff that they said and did at that time was out there. And quite frankly, if Louis C.K. hadn't become such, such a uh, absolute idiot with his sex capades, when you look at the monologue from Saturday Night Live where he talks about pedophilia, I mean, you know, there's a certain element of comedy. Lenny Bruce, these people that are on the edge that are making people uncomfortable by it and finding humor in it is, you know, yes, it's it's not something that you necessarily uh, want to endorse, but to some extent, the humor in it is just by the fact that this exists and people do seem to, at that time, ignore it. I would say, so there are certain parts of Richard Pryor that I think have actually aged well, um, it, kind of poking fun at us, taking ourselves too seriously. The same could be said for Carlin, particularly his seven dirty words for like how um, neutered we wanted television to be by comparison to where we are now. But you and I tried to watch uh, Eddie Murphy's 80s specials, and he's doing jokes on uh, Raw, Eddie Murphy no, Raw. I think it was the one before that. I don't think it was Raw, but uh, you and I were watching that, and I, I think this might have been a couple of years ago, but he was making jokes about, like, AIDS and homosexuality, and yes. those clearly have aged extremely poorly. So, like, you, you could pick and choose, but some of it, it – it's a difficult subject material, and I do have to at least mention it. So it's, it's why I knocked it down to a 4.5. Oh, boy, you really knocked it down. I had oh, I an know. eight. Wow. So uh, let's see here. I mean, this is not like uh, Birth of a Nation and having blackface. No, that would get like a straight zero. <laughs> okay. Um, the fact that most movies that had any type of song and dance number in them in like the 30s, um, for whatever reason, had to have a minstrel show up um, is <laughs> extremely problematic and will get downgraded immediately as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but your um, eight brings it up to a 6.25 for the overall category. Uh, rewatchability. This isn't one of those that I revisit personally. And so, again, this being a subjective thing, I it's a very short movie. It's very easy to watch. You get through it very quickly, in and out. It's on Netflix. Um, so if you haven't seen the movie, go ahead and watch it. If you have seen it, probably go ahead and rewatch it. Um, I would recommend this to just about anybody. But um, this is one where I don't have any problems with it. It's just not one that I've often revisited, although I have probably watched it now like three times in the last month, uh, oddly enough. Um part of it in preparation for this movie, but also we had, uh, I think I saw it on cable and um, we had thrown it on for something, some other purpose just to throw on in the background. But um, I gave it an eight. Um, it's just, it's one of those, it's really good. It's easily rewatchable, but it's not a go-to for me. I had 7.5 and this is why, even though I love the film, it's one that if you watch too frequently, it's just not as entertaining. You need to you yeah, need to let that. it you need to let it settle settle out and to kind of rediscover some of the jokes uh, for them to be funny. Yeah, and I I would say that that's likely of most comedies. Now that you mention it, it's it's a good perspective on the whole thing as far as trying to rewatch this one. Uh, 
you you do occasionally need distance in order to appreciate things more. So, but that brings it to a 7.75 for rewatchability and with a 89% audience score. So for 8.9 points, let me total that up here. That was 8.63 for legacy nine uh, for impact significance, 9.25 for novelty, 6.25 for classicness, 7.75 for rewatchability, and an 8.9 in audience score for a total score of 49.78, which will place it squarely uh, right in between. Circularly? Sure. Thank you for um, elevating the joke. But that will put it squarely between American Graffiti at number 11 and E.T. at number 13. Which okay. is a little bit surprising. Well, Although some people hold the E.T. in a very high regard. so, But I, I don't think it's even close to one of uh, Spielberg's best films. I wouldn't even put it in this top 10. Boy, that's... That's tough. I can name. I mean, I, know, I can start I know rattling made a lot off. of good movies. I, I like. No, uh, no, no, no. Hold on. And when we get to I these, like this, or then E.T. Let Let's hold off and do a Spielberg centric movie at some other point, or not movie, but uh, episode um, on you know his top or his best movies, and we can run that one back, but. Uh, all right, so that does it for episode uh, 33. How are we feeling going on with this list? Good. I um, am somewhat surprised that we've been doing this for 33 weeks. For everything that's gone on this year, the fact that we're we're doing this and, you know, I there are some definite surprises in our top five, top ten, um, as far as uh, movies we've gone about, and I've enjoyed doing these. Uh, next week, we're doing Bull Durham with a special guest of ours, uh, somebody from our podcast town community um, that will be coming on to uh, talk about that as one of his favorite movies. You and I are also doing a special episode with uh, another guest that uh, I met uh on another social media platform um, for the social network, ironically, uh, for next week. But uh, I think we have several other guests lined up for um, what we would hope is the last 17 episodes of this season and many more to come after that. So are, have we uh, decided to announce our 50th show yet? Well, I mean, we've got a ways to go. I mean, it's September and that's well, not I know, but like December. I, I, but if you want to, I'm well, not going to do it as a It could do as a teaser. I mean, it's going to end the, the first season. So we figured we would go with probably what is arguably the best film ever, Casablanca. Well, I mean, if you wanted to tease it, next time we can do like very uh, obscure trivia questions and see if anybody writes in the show um, in order to uh, uh, figure it out. Maybe we can make up some T-shirts or something. Well, yeah, we could get some we could get some tchotchkes. And then do trivia questions over the last part of the season and then into next season. And if you write in and you get the correct or the trivia question correct, we'll put if there's more than one, we'll put it in a a drawing and the drawing will get the tchotchke. You are so old referring to them as tchotchkes. That if you go to any of the websites that are selling, you know, like uh you know, uh, gear, paraphernalia, coffee cups, pins, all this stuff for TV shows. The 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 standard in the industry is still to call them tchotchkes. All right. Um, it's not the standard. The standard now is swag, but be older. Anyway, I Whatever. wish we could talk. I wish we could talk longer, but I'm expecting a friend for dinner. Thanks, everybody, for a great week. Next week, like I said, we'll be discussing Bull Durham with our special guest, Roger Walkoff. Stick around on this feed for that one. 
If you'd like to um, give a listener comment or contact the show, please email us at greatestalltimemoviepodcast at gmail.com. Again, that's greatestalltimemoviepodcast at gmail.com. The Greatest Movie of All Time is a production of Ronnie Duncan Studios. Our show is mixed, edited, and written by Thomas Duncan. Our music is thanks to Purple Planet Music. Thanks, everybody, and have a great rest of your week.